Welcome to Soundtrack Your Life, a podcast about soundtracks, music, and movies. Each episode features a guest and focuses on a specific soundtrack and the personal stories connected to it. Now here's your host, Ryan Pack. Yes, I am Ryan Pack, and welcome to the podcast. Uh, this is the podcast where we blend personal connections to soundtracks and we geek out a little bit about the music. Today we're going to cover the 1986 Richard Lowenstein film, Dogs in Space. And my guest today is the guitarist from the Guilty Hearts, Edgar Rodriguez. Welcome to the show, Edgar. Uh, thanks, Ryan. It's awesome to be on, man. Uh, big fan already. I'll be honest, when you mentioned that you picked out Dogs in Space, I, hadn't, I wasn't exactly, I had no <laughs> idea what you were talking about. <laughs> I'm not saying this to be silly, but Dogs in Space is not an animated film. It's not, it's not, it can't be sci-fi film. It is, it is a low budget Australian film yeah. uh, about a band. Yeah. It, it, it's a, it's a classic, in my mind, it's like, it's a classic rock and roll movie, right? It's like, if, if you like things like Almost Famous or Sid and Nancy or, or things like that, uh, Backbeat, that's another good one. Like, uh, like those, this movie fits kind of in that universe of, of, of films. Uh, it's definitely, it's definitely niche. Uh, but I think that's what I like so much about it. So when I bring a person on, we usually talk about, uh, what their connection is to the movie. So why, are, yeah. why are we talking about, uh, dogs in space today, Edgar? Man, this is one of those movies that like, you know, changed my life. I think in, in a lot of ways, I mean, right away just like the overall energy of the film is i related to it completely it, it resonated with me it was just that like wild young rock and roll abandon you know it's like i'm i'm here for the good time you know the movie opens up and, and i'm trying not to spoil too much of it but the movie opens up uh with a group of of kids camped out waiting for david bowie tickets and uh you know some uh, some some wackiness ensues and and one of the one of the kids ends up on the hood of a car you know and uh you know he's he's yelling these words out and i'm like what is this guy yelling and uh that was kind of like the first hidden clue in this movie and this movie is just filled with lots of little hidden rock and roll clues you know and and what that turned out to be is he was he was shouting the lyrics to Frankie Teardrop by the band Suicide. You know, came to find that find that out like years later when I finally heard Suicide. I was like, wait a minute, let's go back. It's like, yes, this is from Dogs in Space. Here's here's like another piece to the puzzle. I mean, overall, the what it did for me was I connected with the characters in the film. I, I saw myself in the characters in the film, not all of them because some of them were pretty uh, messed up, but I definitely like, I, I, it was like looking at my group, my group of friends, you know, they were doing the same things. They were going to parties, they were playing music, they were going to rock shows and small clubs, you know, and, and in a lot of ways it, it helped to refine my taste in music. You know, at, at by that age, I was, I was still like, I was still really into the Jesus and Mary chain. I was really into Love and Rockets. Uh, I was really into the Cramps. Um, so there was kind of a theme there, and it was like this, like fuzzy, primitive, lo-fi music. Uh, and I couldn't get enough of it. Like I wanted more. I wanted more. I wanted more. And this movie and the soundtrack was just filled with this kind of stuff. Like whether it was like tiny bits of songs and scenes or whether it was like the live performances in the movie. Uh, man, I was already a Nick Cave fan and this was like the first time I had heard uh, The Boys Next Door. You know, there's this whole sequence where they're, they're watching a Nick Cave video um, uh, for the song Shivers. And uh, so that was my introduction to, to the boys next door. There's a party scene where there's like this tiny snippet of a song that took me years to figure out that it was actually the birthday party. And it was a, it's a song, Mr. Clarinet by the birthday party. Uh, and I was obsessed with this, you know, six second snippet of a song uh, just because it sounded so cool. Um, you know, I, 
it was the first time I had heard um, gang, a Gang of Four song that I liked. <laughs> uh, so, because you know, K Rock would only ever play, you know, I love a man in uniform. And man, like that drives me bananas, right? But like in the movie, like Anthrax, you know, that like with the full guitar intro and the feedback, and man, it was all of it. I mean, Brian Eno's on the soundtrack. Um, Iggy Pops on the soundtrack. Uh, there's uh, all these great Australian bands, which, man, that... So we went from, like, Love and Rockets, Jesus and Mary Chain, to now I'm, you know, I was already listening to Nick Cave. I discovered The Boys Next Door. I tracked down The Birthday Party. I found some Gang of Four that I liked. Brian Eno was in it, which just kind of opened up a whole nother world of music, you know, uh, that eventually led me to appreciating things like, you know, early Roxy music, uh, which again, the radio just played things that I was not really into, but like the early Roxy music records with Eno on them were fantastic. Like the connection with Bowie and Eno, fantastic. Um, but more than anything, like the live performances of the bands, like the bands that were in the film were not like, they weren't the Beatles, right? <laughs> they, they weren't like musicians at the top of their form, but they were raw and primal and real. And I connected with that. And I think that was, for me, that was additional inspiration to continue playing music because I, I wasn't the greatest musician. I, I'm still not, you know, but it's, it, it's playing from the heart. It's playing what's real. And I think that really, that movie set the tone for me in a lot of ways in, in the, it like, it refined my taste in music in the sense that there was like this subgenre of the subgenres that I was listening to that just kind of led to even like smaller bits of music. And what it did for me in the long run is that I was able to find other like-minded individuals who were into the same kind of music or would say like, Oh man, you know, you like that, uh, you like that Anthrax song by, you know, Gang of Four? Well, you know, check this other thing out. And, and it just, like, it led me to more and more music. You know, I mean, granted, this was before the internet, before smartphones, before Spotify, where, like, you know, you had to do tape trading. You know, your music taste depended on, you know, uh, kind record store clerks that, that would talk you out of buying, you know, a Motley Crue record and, and, you know, push you towards like, you know, Susie and the Banshees or, or something that's a little bit more interesting. <laughs> uh, but um, nothing, not that there's anything wrong with Motley Crue, but I'm just going to say that. Uh, yeah, but I mean, it, like, all of it, the look, the feel. Um, I mean, there's a lot of like pervasive drug use and some bad shit happens in the movie, which, you know, I don't condone. I don't think it should be glorified. I think it's taken out way too many talented people. Um, so I think that's one unfortunate aspect of the movie that I don't really love. Uh, but it, it's a reality, right? It's a reality. that It's something that happens in, in, in rock and roll and, and in non rock and roll things like, excess is, is just one of those things that happened. Which is kind of interesting to me because it stars Michael Hutchins from In Excess. None of these <laughs> bands sound like In Excess. Very, very true. Richard Lowenstein, who directed the movie, is best known for directing In Excess videos. Not that that's all he's known for, but... He um, did do a U2 movie. He did a, do a U2 movie. <laughs> I think he also Edgy. did something for Pete Townsend. Oh, man. That is... Uh, yeah. Ooh, edgy. Uh, yeah, I mean, Michael Hutchins, aside from his live performances in the movie, pretty much his role is to, like, have good hair and roll around on the floor, like, wrapped in a blanket. And, like, he grunts. Like, the majority of his dialogue through the movie is, like, grunts or, like, one word, like, food, you know. Uh, so... Yeah, I mean it's it it was it was cool to see him in that light, and um, I was worried that I I wasn't going to believe him in the role. But I think at the time, you know, I think he was probably much closer to that version of Michael Hutchins than the version of Michael Hutchins that we knew in 1991. 
right? right. So um, he wasn't like the slick rock and roller. Although at the end of the film, he is he is in a very like I don't know like proto Madonna Vogue like suit with like very wide pant legs, and I'm I'm pretty sure he's barefoot. Um, so there's that too. <laughs> So the role was written for Michael Hutchins. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think I think the 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 vibe I get from the whole cast is that a lot of the people knew each other. I think, you know, Richard and and Michael Hutchins had a, you know, had a friendship. I think a lot of the the side characters like uh, like Nick Needles and, uh, you know, the, the, the drummer and like the guitar players in the band. Like, I think they were all musicians in like the local Australian scene. And, you know, it was just like people that knew each other that ended up, you know, making this movie. You know, it was, it was interesting. I rewatched the, uh, the movie uh, last, uh, I guess earlier this week. Yeah. If anybody's interested, Dogs in Space can be found on YouTube, the full thing for free. Uh, I, I don't even recall getting a commercial. So if you're interested, you can go check it out there. Um, but one of the cast members uh, is just credited as the girl. Uh, it's this uh, actor by the name of uh, Deanna Bond. And uh, so I was like, whatever happened to Deanna Bond? And so I, I was wondering what else she did and, and doesn't look like she did any other films, but kind of digging through it, it I, I came to learn that, that she is the Deanna that Nick Cave and the Bad Seeds wrote Deanna about. I was like, wow, that's pretty cool. I, I didn't realize it. Nick Cave, I guess, called her his muse for, for many, many years, um, which just completely makes sense you know boys next door in the cave all australian you know before they they went to the uk so i'm having trouble placing in excess in like the 80s kind of pop scene mm -hmm. like you know maybe because i like you know because i listen to mostly indie rock so like when it comes to the 80s it's like replacements and husker do and new order and the smiths and like i you know i listen to a bunch of bands that all kind of come from those like lineages you know, you can tell these bands were were influenced by these '80s bands. In excess, like I know they were really popular. I know the the big hits. What is it? Need you tonight? Like I can't. Like when I hear that song, like I can't get it out of my head for like a week. <laughs> I I, I always I always get them confused in my head with Fine Young Cannibals. I, I always think that she drives me crazy song is in excess and uh, I'm always wrong. Oh, I would also make that same mistake. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I like, I like some of the cuts off the first record that Shabu Shaba. I, I think that's, that's pretty good. Listen like thieves has got some good songs. I mean, like I said, I, I think it's just like, song fatigue when it comes to anything off kick or anything like in the later stuff that got a ton of, of airplay on, on MTV or on the radio, like you couldn't get away from it. Uh, it's, it's one of those songs like safety dance or 99 Luff balloons that can put you into PTSD after hearing it for the billionth time. Yeah. It's one of those songs where like, if you were going to make a movie about the eighties, you know, you'd be like, Oh, need you tonight needs to be on. <laughs> Uh yeah, late eighties maybe. Yeah, yeah late right. Late eighties, you've got you've got kind of an edgy rebel character. Yeah, like what happened to to Judd Hirsch's uh, character, uh, you know, from the Breakfast Club, like after the the credits stopped rolling. Yeah, like what happened to, when he got home? He yeah. got a job and then he started listening to NXS. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he went kind of prep for Molly Ringwald, and he opened a, a tire shop and uh, you know sold tires for the rest of his life. It was a good, honest earning. You know, it's good, honest life. And, uh, you know, but it, it was, it was never like that rebellious thing that he wanted. Yeah. That simple minds rebellious thing. He yeah. Wanted. <laughs> Man, uh, totally off topic, but I got to show this. Uh, I, I was having some washing machine problems the other day and I, I called the manufacturer and, 
uh, it said, you know, hold times might be longer than usual. And, and then it says your, your current hold time is going to be 53 minutes. And then don't you forget about me started playing right after. I thought that was kind of sadistic. Yeah, that's pretty, that's pretty mean. <laughs> There's a great joke about that song in um, Futurama. Uh-huh. There's a, it's a really sad episode. It's about, um, it's about uh, Fry having this lucky clover and then his brother ends up stealing it basically after he gets cryogenically frozen. Mm-hmm. Um, but there's, when his brother finds the clover, it's his, it's his brother's wedding. And he ends up opening the safe looking for some records to play at the wedding. And he finds the Breakfast Club soundtrack and he goes, ah, this will clear the room out at the end of the night. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> uh. That's awesome. I uh, I think we used to play Physical by Olivia Newton-John uh, in my bar DJ days to, to get people to leave. That usually worked. <laughs> oh, that's pretty, that's pretty good. Yeah. Um, I was at a, uh, it was my best friend's birthday and we were in some Manhattan bar where they, I believe if you buy a pizza, they'll give you a free beer like one of those places. Wow. And there was a DJ just playing like my Sharona on loop. Oh, and that's a pretty good way to get people to leave. Yeah. I had a friend that went to go see one of these like internet pop star type people. And, um, essentially they had like a DJ build as the warm up act. And all it was, was, was like a mannequin on stage with, with headphones on, and it just, they just played uh, Toto's Africa for two and a half hours before the, the main act came on. I, I was like, that's like some mental warfare. Yeah, that's, that's like a performance art exhibit. <laughs> oh, no, I was just going to say, so Michael Hutchins, there's also, there's also a point in the movie, and it's on the soundtrack too, where he reads this... Uh, this uh like a children's story to his girlfriend uh it's called the green dragon it's pretty funny talks about like uh insincere people and and dragons eating them i feel like that had to have come from some like real authentic place since richard lowenstein who directed the movie also wrote it like oh uh, yeah that, that green dragon story can't just you know it had to have come from some sort of conversation, if not from a conversation he had with Michael Hutchins, but like with someone in that scene, right? Like, yeah, I don't it's know. Too specific Maybe. to be like, oh, I think this is like really profound, and I should put this in my movie. <laughs> yeah, I, I guess I didn't think about it in, that, in those terms. You know, it's it's very. I think I'm when it comes to movies like this, I get very lost in them and forget that they that they are works of art that are like thought through and structured and written and, you know, uh, edited in, in, in certain ways, you know, I get really, really lost in the story, uh, especially for this movie. Yeah. I was reading a little bit about um, the director. And so Richard Lowenstein's father flees from Germany to England um, because of the Nazi occupation. And then England shipped him to Australia. Wow during that dark time in England's history where they didn't trust anyone. They just started shipping all these, you know, quote, fake agents, unquote, to Canada and Australia because they, they weren't sure if they were going to betray England. Wow. So that's how the Lowenstein family ended up in Australia. What a trip. And then Lowenstein grows up in Melbourne. This movie is very personal to him because basically he's recreating that scene. Uh, in the movie, right? Like, like that's what this whole movie is about. Yeah, I mean, it, it's supposed to be 1978 in the movie. Um, you know, it's like everybody's obsessed with with Bowie and Skylab, and you know, there's like this whole running theme in the movie where it's like there's a bounty for anybody that can recover a piece of uh, of Skylab that's crashed down into the Earth. So at one point, the characters decide to make their own space junk. They, like, bake a transistor radio. It's pretty funny. 
So the movie's called Dogs in Space because that's what the band name is. Yeah, exactly. Then, that's that's then, Michael Hutchinson's band, yeah. And then Dogs in Space is a reference to, isn't it the first dog in space? Like that's what's happening in 1978 as well? Uh, that I don't know. I don't know my space history all that well. I think 1978, it was like Star Wars, right? <laughs> um, <laughs> that's, yeah, that's real life, right? Yeah, the real life Star Wars, not <laughs> the Reagan program Star Wars. So I was at a music festival and Incubus was playing. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I, yeah, I know that you were not looking forward to the story. <laughs> um, so, I was, so we were watching Incubus play and they covered Need You Tonight by... Oops, sorry. In Excess. So, yeah, so they covered that song by In Excess. And is is that in excess's like legacy, like Incubus? Oh, uh, is that was it unironic? It was very unironic. Oh man, it was oh. like a very straight cover of the song. I, mean, I I don't think you can talk about Michael Hutchins without mentioning, you know, he passed in 1997. Yeah, that was brutal. And then in 2005, in excess is on CBS trying to find a new lead singer on a reality show hosted by oh. Dave Navarro. Oh. I forgot Dave Navarro was on that. That is nuts. I remember, I think I watched like 20 minutes of one episode, uh, but I don't even know like what came of that. I thought they were looking for like a permanent singer that they were going to tour with. Um, yeah, I think... I think they found someone that lasted like seven years. I didn't watch the show and I had completely forgotten it existed till um, I was telling, I was telling Eunice that we were going to be doing a movie about uh, that. We were doing this movie. Uh Michael Hutchins was the star and she's like, Oh yeah. In excess. uh, They had that, they had that reality singing show to find a new lead singer. And I was like, Oh, right. Wow. So I just quickly looked him up just to, you know, just like who won that whole thing. So it's this guy by the name of JD Fortune. He's, he's a Canadian guy. And uh, so, oh, this, so here it is. So the, the CBS reality TV show was called Rockstar. Rockstar. Um, and uh yeah so he was in it in in excess uh for for it looks looks like six years 2005 to 2011 and then according to this reuters uh story it says in excess singer says he's broke and homeless after being fired from the band oh, that's not a happy end at all <laughs> uh that that's uh that's brutal that's brutal Sounds like he's got some songs on Spotify, though, if, if anybody wants to check that out. Uh, he kind of looks like uh, he kind of looks like the guy that played the werewolf dude in the Twilight movies uh, with like Billy Joe Armstrong from Green Day's hair. <laughs> um, that is that is a uh, that would be Taylor Lautner, right? Taylor yeah, yeah, yeah. Lautner. Taylor Taylor Lautner uh, with a Billy Joe Armstrong wig. That's pretty funny. Yeah, not quite Michael Hutchins. Uh, well, I mean, it, you know, one one thing I can respect about Hutchins is I feel like he has that like frontman swagger that you don't see in a lot of bands these days. Oh, for sure. I was just thinking that there aren't a lot of front men left. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, I, yeah, like I, I remember seeing a show a few years ago, and Perry Farrell came out, and just like the way he walks on stage versus like anybody else these days, it's like you know, like there was an art to being a front man that I feel like has been lost. Yeah, absolutely. I feel like everybody was like, "Hey, I, I, I also play guitar. Check this out. I'm gonna sing it and play guitar." Like there's just not that ego anymore of like, I'm going to like literally stalk the stage. You know, like that's how I felt like Perry was like, he was stalking the stage. He was, he was I mean, strutting on stage. Like it, it was, you know, it was 
I don't want to say weird, but you know, it's unique, right? Like now it's unique. You've probably, you know, 40 years ago, everyone was doing it, but yeah, you needed a front man. You didn't want somebody that hit behind a guitar. It's like, you know, who are you? Crosby, Stills, Nash and Young. Like, you know, it's, it's like, that was not, that was not the norm. You know, I remember seeing Jane's addiction uh, at the John Anson Ford um, and Perry would do all these crazy things. Like he would, he would come out on stage and he would just like throw tortillas at the audience or like one night it was craft singles. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's, it was, it was something, I mean, I feel like the front man is the guy that like connects with the audience. And it's like when you're behind an instrument, like I feel like it happens, but it's a barrier. I, it's almost like, I don't know if it's if it's the ego that says I sing and I play guitar, or I really don't want to be the front man, so I'm going to hide behind my instrument. So I don't. I think it's one of those two psychologies. I, I definitely think that you know he's the maybe not the last, but he's you know part of a a dying breed, and maybe that's maybe that's where the incubus comes influence comes in. Like Brandon Boyd feels like he is. He is one of the last front men and he needed to pay tribute to Michael Hutchins. Man. But what about the dude from Smash Mouth? Isn't he a front man too? Um sure. <laughs> no, I mean I'm just trying to invalidate your argument about uh, I, Incubus. I'm just trying to make the connection of the like in excess influence over Incubus, because I don't feel like Incubus. Yeah, that is kind of random. Like, like I'm I'm I guess there's a little bit of funkiness to Incubus, but but Incubus is funky was like fishbone funky, you know, like like in excess. While I'm not a huge fan of them, like it's like a different sort of different sort of funk. Like they worked with Nile Rodgers sort of funk, you know. Ah, uh, I like me some Nile Rodgers. No, oh, I love him. I saw him last year. He was great. I I'm t- I I'm probably totally wrong, but I thought I saw. He didn't pass away, did he? No. He's he's uh, alive and well. Okay. I, I think he know. got sick a few years ago. Yeah. Because he, he was saying when I when we saw him live, um, when we saw him live, he was talking about how, you know, he almost died, and then he's using this, you know, second lease on life to go out and tour and try to make as much music as he can. That's awesome, man. I mean, he's contributed so much to music. It's, you know, people don't even realize like his contributions and like all the stuff that, that, uh, you know, that he's done for just like modern music. I mean, let's dance. David Bowie would not be let's dance without him. You know, it's like the sister sledge. We are family. That was his, you know, his, all the work he did with Duran Duran. Right, good times became rapper's delight. Yeah, exactly. So, I mean, it's a it's a deep influence, you know, and it's that's one thing that I love to see in music that it like, you know, you connect with something and 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 you give it new life, you know, by just carrying that torch. You know, I, I, that's really what folk music's about. You know, in my mind, it's like just getting up and doing it. He's worked with everyone from Bowie to Diana Ross, you know, now to Daft Punk, right? Like it spans decades. And if you, and if you look at, you know, all the hip hop songs that have sampled his music, then, then, you know, it even branches out even farther. Like the nineties I felt like was, was just like Puff Daddy, especially loved sampling stuff that now Niall Rogers worked on. Yeah. You think he got paid? remember that was like a, a period where um you know the the whole sampling controversy right i thought that was like the early 90s yeah because of those de la soul records oh man and, and like beastie boys paul boutique like they had like just samples they went nuts samples they went nuts on that record yeah so i think puff daddy probably had to pay niall rogers something i hope so I hope you I hope you paid him lots of money. But yeah, now Rogers also worked with NXS. <laughs> oh, full circle. Nice. I had no idea. 
I, I think it was on one of the earlier records. Oh, uh, okay. I thought you were going to tell me that's where, uh, you know, the, the funkiness for Need You Tonight came from. It, it does, it's not his guitar playing enough to, for that riff. You know, like that riff doesn't sound enough like that vintage Nile Rodgers sort of guitar, guitar playing. Yeah, I wonder how much it, it was. He was an influence on those later records. It was original, original sin. Original sin. Or was it? Or is that? Or that's a song. The song. Original oh, sin. got it, got it. So maybe he just did a few singles for them, not a whole album. Hmm. But I don't see how you can work with Nile Rodgers and be like, we're done being influenced by him. Yeah. I mean, he's just one of those guys that's got the, the golden touch. Man, so back to the movie. Uh, so, you know, I was talking... Yeah, no, I'm sorry. We both digress. Um, you know, I was talking about like, um, you know, little hidden clues like the, the Frankie teardrop... Um, the Mr. Clarinet and the party scene. Uh, there's also like a screamers poster in, in the house, which, you know, as you're discovering music, you're like, ah, wait, there's, here's this thing. You know, in 1991, I had heard of the screamers had never heard the screamers cause they hadn't put anything out officially. And I didn't know anybody cool enough to had a copy of the demo. Uh, but what, eventually when I heard it and I saw what the artwork looked like, I understood that that was, you know, it was exactly what that was. And, you know, it's uh, it's a trip when you start to to dig into like the bands that were in the, the movie and like who some of the members were. Like uh, there's a song in the movie called True Love by a band called The Marching Girls. The Marching Girls... Um, were originally called scavengers and they were that I believe they were from New Zealand. Um, but so the lead singer of scavengers and the marching girls is Brendan Perry and Brendan Perry is in a band called dead can dance these days. And it is nothing like dead can dance. You know, this is like classic, 70s you know power pop you know like punk for the time uh so i mean it's you just keep the more times you watch this movie the more you pick up on little bits and pieces which to you know kind of a, a rock nerd like me uh is awesome you know it's like i i have a I have a true love for, for rock and roll. I have a true love for, for punk rock. And, and there's so much of, of that in the movie that, you know, it, I've carried with me. You know, it's like from, from Nick Cave to the boys next door to the birthday party. Then you understand Roland S. Howard. Roland S. Howard was the guitar player in the boys next door and the birthday party. And then went on to have this awesome solo career that, you know, it, like he he was never huge. He was never selling out places like the Wiltern. He probably could have come to town and played like, I don't know, the Roxy or, or Spaceland or the Echo and packed it out. But, you know, it, the, there's like this respect uh, for the musicians um, affiliated with this, with this movie. And it's like a cult following. And it's, uh, you know, the, the roots go out so far that, uh, you could you could spend a couple years just kind of following one of the branches of of the musical family tree that is the soundtrack of of uh, Dogs in Space. Yeah, and when I heard the soundtrack, um, I immediately understood like when you know, like I've seen your band play live, I've heard your band's music, yeah. and i i under, I understood immediately like why yeah. you love the soundtrack. And, and it's directly had an influence on, on your art. Oh, for sure. For sure. It was just one of those things that like, it was like finding, finding some, it's like an ancient artifact that you had been searching for 
you know, that you didn't know existed and, uh, you know, you find it and, and you love it and you appreciate it and you devour it and it becomes a part of you. You know, it's, it's just, like I said, it, it just, it refined my taste already. Cause I was already listening to like, you know, bands that were like very fuzz heavy, that were very primitive, that were very lo-fi. Um, but still had like this like haunting melodic quality. Like it's, you listen to like, you know, like Jesus and Mary chain. It's like, uh, you, know, you can hear the beach boys in, in that music, you know, but it's like, you know, through the, through the cloud cover in Glasgow, uh, you know, it's, but that's, I think for me, that's, that's very much who I am. You know, I think that's very much a part of like growing up in Southern California is like you've got you've got yes you've got the sunshine and the beach and the and the palm trees but it's like there's also like this undercurrent the underbelly of southern california and it's like oh i I guess like disneyland is like a good analogy for (laughs) for growing up in southern california where it's like you know it's like it's the haunted mansion it's these dark rides set against this like bright colorful utopia that's got this like dark you know scary underbelly if you look at it too close i don't know if you've ever like stared like the the small children in in the small world right like directly in the eye for too long i'm convinced like there's like actual souls trapped in those bodies but you know i'm probably in the minority now that's a creepy ride (laughs) i do not like that ride (laughs) oh yeah but i mean it's in a in in a way it was like you know there's a there's another band that like really like hit me between the eyes on the soundtrack called primitive calculators and it took me years to find that record i think i found it probably like 2002 uh like randomly there was like a reissue uh and like uh there was this small record store in eagle rock uh california and uh called don's music and i went in there and and he didn't have it on vinyl he had it on cd it was my only choice i'd probably been looking for that record by that band any record by that band the primitive calculators uh probably since i saw the movie i mean the 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 song is called pumping ugly muscle uh and it is just very again rock and roll to the lowest common denominator drum machine feedback grunting yelling like it's uh, i don't know it's like my it's my spirit animal is the soundtrack something that you like brought the band practice one day and you're like hey guys <laughs> y'all gotta listen to it <laughs> no in, in fact um you know i was so enamored with the movie that i would try and get other people to watch it and so many times, like, I'd show it to other people and I'd get teased for weeks. They're like, why do you like this movie? It's terrible. <laughs> it's like this movie. It's like that movie. It's derivative. I'm like, but the soundtrack's so good. And they're like, oh, blah. You know, it's not this. It's not that. I don't know. I don't know if it's for everyone. But, I mean, for me, it just really struck a chord, you know. It's like like the Brian Eno track that's on it, a song called Sky Saw. Um, you know, the, the weird thing in the movie is that it's like, it's like a punk rock party house, but there's also like hippies that live there. So like, there's this like one hippie dude that like scores with all the girls and like he puts on Brian Eno when he's going to like make out with them. Uh, so that's, that's the setting of the sky saw song, but it, um, I mean, that's probably something that I would have never gone and picked out myself. Like I would have never been like, oh, Brian Eno, yeah, this is like that synthesizer guy. I'm going to check this out. But, you know, it's like I was forced to listen to that song. It's stuck in my head. And it was just one of those things where it's like, okay, well, I want more of this. And so, you know, you, you go out and you seek it out and, you know, Eno le- leads you to Roxy Music and Roxy Music leads you to something else. And, you know, that leads you to something else and it leads you to something else and, you know, next thing you know, it's 2006 and you're at a, at, at a fall show meeting Marky Smith backstage because, you know, you picked up a Brian Eno record. Oh, crazy. 
actually happened, man. Actually yeah. happened. Um, he was uh, Marky Smith was was classic Marky Smith. He was very grumpy, uh, but he was very gracious, and, and he indulged me with a photo. Uh, so I was very grateful for that one. Yeah, I'm super jealous. <laughs> the Falls just one of those bands, man. That like uh, it spans like so many different like like fans of different genres of music can all agree on a band like the fall. Uh, and, you know, I, I think that's, that's what I, I found with a lot of this stuff is that, you know, it, it creates common ground where there wouldn't be otherwise, you know, and it's, we need more unity in the world. But is that also why you hate pavement so much? Cause they're known, for, <laughs> they were accused of ripping off the fall. Oh man. Pavement. <laughs> Yeah, you know, pavement is like my favorite band. I know pavement is like your favorite band, so I'm so I'm trying to restrain myself. Uh, yeah, I mean, I guess I just never. They just didn't move me. Like it was like, uh, I just the one time I saw them play, and this was like a awesome bill. It was like Mud Honey opened. Sonic Youth played second and Pavement played last. Like, it's like, how can, in my mind, I was like, there, there's no way Pavement can follow Mud Honey and Sonic Youth. Like, there's, there was just no way. It was like the energy was totally different. Um, you know, I think maybe now if I went back and I listened to like Pavement on like a rainy day and I had like a really comfortable cardigan that maybe had some holes in it and I had some, you know, some nice organic chamomile tea and I'd be sipping it, you know. Yeah, I think maybe I'd, I'd dig Pavement now at my age. But at the time, it was not very rock and roll. Oh, that's fair. I think, I think their level of rock and roll is definitely not for everybody. Yeah, for sure. I mean, it's nothing against them. It just wasn't. It wasn't. It wasn't my cup of tea. <laughs> yeah, I went there. I'm sorry. So thank you, Edgar, for coming on the show. Yeah, it's been a blast, man. Is there anything you want to promote? Um, no, not at the time. I mean, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm working on. Uh, we were going to do another Guilty Hearts record, and then COVID happened. And uh, you know, we may eventually do that. I mean, we were we were eager to do another record and go back out on the road, get back out to Europe. We were talking about South America, talking about Japan. Um, all of that's on hold. Uh, so I, I don't know. I, I've got a I've got a new project that you know it's all me. Uh, it's kind of it's kind of scary to 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 be doing it all myself. I'm so used to collaborating, but uh, that should see the light of day. Um, if not by the end of this year, then early next year, you know, that it's called dog roses. Uh, that should be out soon. Very cool. Yeah. And if people want to check out the guilty hearts, what's the easiest way for them to do that? Ah, man. Well, so we're on Spotify. We're on, uh, Apple music. We're on Amazon music. We're on Pandora. So yeah, you can, you can find us on any of those services. Or uh, you can find it on YouTube if you don't if you don't pay for any of those services. I think the, both uh, both of our albums are up on YouTube in their entirety. Very cool. Thanks for joining us this week on Soundtrack Your Life. Make sure to visit our website soundtrackyourlife.net, where you can subscribe to the show on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. While you're at it, if you found value in the show, we'd appreciate a rating. Or if you'd simply tell a friend about the show, that would help us out too.